Cheers, guys. Epix 911, welcome to the Saturday, April 29th, 2017 edition of VR News. Not a heck of a lot going on today. Some interesting stuff. We're going to start with kind of one of my not favorite, favorite topics, Kickstarters. So a product called the VR Glove, G-L-U-V, which is a haptic feedback glove, funded today. And I want to talk about, you know, why that's not necessarily a good thing. And that old subject about Kickstarters with me. So longtime viewers to the channel kind of know my stance on Kickstarters. It's not that I'm negative. It's just that I have a very strict set of criteria before funding, you know, or backing something. I've backed about eight, nine different Kickstarters. Here are kind of my, my you know, quick summary of my checklist items. So first thing, is it too complex? If it's too technically complex, it's likely to fail. Are there exceptions to that rule? Absolutely. But the majority of the time, that's a valid a valid thing with Kickstarters. The more technically complex, the less likely to succeed. Is the hurdle for the product over after that initial funding or does it then require additional requirements or hurdles to be overcome in order to be successful? And this product kicks in on that category specifically. We'll get back to that. And then kind of the last one is industry experience, industry veteran. For example, if it's a video game. So I've backed a lot of video games. Most of them, Brian Fargo games, he of In Exile, Interplay before that. He has a lifetime of experience. Whether you like the guy, can't stand him, you cannot deny the resume he has that is one success after another about taking video games from concept through to publishing many 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 times over and so far haven't been stung by a game of his that i've backed all right so where does vr glove fit in in all of this well when i talked about you know are there hurdles for this product after it funds for this one absolutely there is Let's look at the number of backers. It's about 350, 380 when I looked at it earlier that backed this. It's not a hell of a lot of people. The reason it funded though was because the lowest tiers of backing, enough to get you a unit, were high enough in the hundreds of dollars that they could quickly accumulate what they asked for. Now, along with my other checklist things is, do I think the amount that they asked for is realistic? So many times the number is way out to lunch, either way too high or way too low. So with this VR glove, again, let's go back to the backer count, 300 some odd, that is not a high number for this type of a product. This is going to be a product that caters to tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, soon to be millions of virtual reality HMDs. With that kind of number behind it, you're not convincing developers to develop for this thing. You could pay them, but then you're talking about additional funding to have to pay them to write your VR glove code into the game or the experience. There's other ways, and that's why a lot of the haptic ones, well, not a lot, but some of them use sound. That way, even if a game isn't written specifically, you know, like the Subpack M2, for example, if it's not written for it specifically, it still functions because every game pretty much has sound. There's still a use for that device. So with the VR glove, we've got the haptics and we've got tracking, both of which, based on the video that I saw and the pitch, need to be programmed for specifically. So they have a couple of games already on their list, but they're not great games. They are indie games. There's nothing wrong with that. They're just not the greatest selection of indie games. What is the plan going forward to roll that out? Otherwise, yes, they funded, but the person ends up with a high-priced piece of kit that has absolutely no support and eventually will just gather dust. And again, in no way condemning this to oblivion. they got a long ways to go before that. But those are the types of things to look at, ask, question, look into before backing a product. Now, for all I know, this thing could be way 
you know, massively, hugely successful. My gut instinct tells me you're probably not going to even hear about it this time next year. Hopefully that's not because of negativity, just probably because of obscurity. So say they triple, quadruple the number of backers. We're still only looking at about a thousand. Are they going to be able to make the production runs that they need to based on three, four hundred thousand dollars? To me, that seems pretty low. Maybe you can meet the backers, but what's your supply chain plans? Are you going to be in stores? You're going to need thousands more of these available for other people to order to get that user base up to make it justifiable for developers to develop for unless, again, you pay them. And same argument there, just like with the manufacturing run, do you have enough money to pay developers? So those are just some things to think about. Again, I happen to be talking about VR Glove, but it could be any other product along those same lines that I'm talking about. Just be careful if you're new to it, if you're not sure. If you follow those guidelines, you're probably going to do okay most of the time. You're still going to run into a stinker or two. Absolutely, that's possible. But I think you're going to be a lot better off. Now, wish these guys the best. Hopefully this thing ends up being amazing and well supported and all of that but uh, only time will tell all right next story conan o'brien playing wilson's heart in his uh little segment that he calls clueless gamers now i used to watch conan way back i knew of him as an snl writer in the late 80s early 90s but i remember him from his late night talk show in the 90s and the one thing about him that he's always been honest about is that he's not a gamer. And even in the 90s, when his shows would talk about CD-ROM games and, you know, stuff that was new at the time, he let that be known. So if you don't know that and you go into this and you don't kind of get the sarcastic humor behind that or the fact that he's not really a gamer, you might get the wrong message. But that's not even that important. Because... Far from it being a negative, in my opinion, all of those are positives. It's marketing. Just like Fallon with the Pictionary, I think it's fantastic. Now, the pitch line for all of this was the joke being that he was under the assumption that Wilson's heart had adult content in it. In other words, there was going to be some type of gratification in this for him when he discovered that there wasn't, that it was in fact just a VR game he played disappointed. So I thought it was brilliant and I think that works very well as a marketing thing. It's going to get out to millions of people and you know what? For us, that is not a bad thing. Next story. This is a book. I found this on Clean Indie Reads, just researching for VR topics to talk about today. Like I said, it was uh, pretty slim pickings. And yeah, there was a lot of garbage news, but this one I found really interesting. Love books all my life, Dragonlance, Lord of the Rings, science fiction, so many favorite authors. This book is called Cryptogram Chaos, and it's written by Linda Covella. It's a book for a teen audience. And in the book, she's got a main character. His name is Cody Reynolds. He has a couple of classmates, and they develop a virtual reality game. And the VR HMD is an HMD that through proprietary special software can get into your brain and substitute all the senses so that the game you end up playing is essentially real. So kind of our version of Holodeck in an HMD or the ultimate evolution of an HMD with the sight, the sound, the taste, everything kind of thrown in. Something goes wrong along the way and the hero of the story the protagonist has to fix things and make them better what's neat about this is it's an old medium it is a physical book she's written yeah there's ebook of this available absolutely but that's not the point what i love about this and kind of the irony of it all is she's written this book in a way to have audience participation, the type of immersion you typically wouldn't have with a book. One thing that a book has the power to do, especially a good book, is transport you 
to that world, to that place, but it does it in a passive way. You are reading about the person and their story. You're not actively involved unless it's a choose your own adventure and that's a whole set of other topics. But what she's done, Linda, with this is she's put cryptogram puzzles in this, which is part of that VR game in the story that you, the reader, can solve. Now, solving them doesn't advance the plot, but it makes you feel involved in the story, in the book. And I just thought that was a real clever twist, especially talking about the concept and the topic of virtual reality. Now, she definitely did her research from what I can tell and you know, wasn't uh, completely condemning of the technology or completely praising, just a kind of neutral stance on the technology can be great, but if abused, can also be terrible. So if you're into reading and you like VR, this may be the story for you. Like I said, it's written for a teen audience. I haven't read it myself, so I don't know, you know, if there's a lot in there for adults, but you know what? Some of my favorite teen reading material from back in the day, like Dragonlance, still enjoyable to me today, and I pick them up every once in a while. So it's called Cryptogram Chaos from author Linda Covella. Next news story, Smithsonian opens the first virtual reality exhibit that actually puts you inside an astronaut's helmet. Now, I've actually been to the Smithsonian. My wife and I were in Washington, D.C. a couple of years ago. I think it's about three years ago now. And part of the reason we were there had to do with going to the Smithsonian. So it was a business function, but we had kind of a, a getaway retreat, if you will, to the Smithsonian. And I was absolutely blown away. I love museums. I love art galleries. If you've never been to the Smithsonian, it's pretty damn awe-inspiring when you get there. Now, I was there. It was Greek, Roman history, and Americana. Those were kind of the exhibits that we had access to. But there's so much more. I mean, you'd probably need a month going daily to really cover it all, soak it all in, and get the most out of the experience. So definitely one day in the future, and I will be on the East Coast, I'm going to get to do that again. Now, this VR exhibit, what makes it so cool is it's a four-person ride. So it's almost like having an amusement park ride inside a museum. No, it's not almost like. It is like you actually have the ride in the museum. Now, there's a press release and it's a very simple one. It just says, most of us can only dream about being in space, but now Smithsonian visitors can have the sensation of actually going there. So in the ride, you get in, you strap yourself in, put the HMD on, it pitches, elevates, puts you through all of the stuff that as if you were on the space shuttle. So the cargo holds, all that kind of stuff, you get to not only experience it visually, the sound is there, and the haptic rumble of the stuff that you feel along the way. Apparently very immersive and a hell of a lot of fun. The company that provided this for the Smithsonian is called Pulseworks, and they're an Atlanta-based motion theater company. They built the VR transporter specifically for the Smithsonian. They've got a long-standing relationship apparently with these guys, having done projects in the past. So very cool. So yeah, if you are in Washington, D.C., checking out the Smithsonian and a fan of VR, do yourself a favor, check that out. And this is not a exhibit temporary that's only going to be there a week or two months. They plan on having this there indefinitely. So very cool. Hopefully it expands to even more. I've got the link to the VR Scout article down below if you want to check out a bit more. And that is it, guys, for the news. Like I said, not a lot, but some interesting stuff. Tomorrow is Sunday, then my last week of employment. Guys, hopefully you're having a kick-ass weekend. Enjoy the rest. And as always, cheers, guys.